Hey everyone, and welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. So glad you're joining with us today. Uh, Pastor Danny Hunt will be joining us once again to bring the word as part of our More Than Shallow Summer Series. I can't wait for you to hear what God has laid on his heart to share today. I know it's going to be a great word. A few reminders and announcements before we get to that. Uh, First of all, next Sunday, that's August the 14th, will be our last fundraiser barbecue for Kids Camp and Youth Camp. Uh, So if you'd like to support those two events and just be a part of a wonderful lunch together as a church, come on out on Sunday, August the 14th. We'll have church together and then have a barbecue uh, together after church in the parking lot with all the proceeds going towards sending our kids and our students towards Kids Camp and Youth Camp. The week after that, Sunday, August the 20th, 21st is our Testimony Sunday. We're going to be uh, re- playing around with the order of things that morning and allowing the stories of our church to be the message, uh, talking about the power of story and the power of testimony and going deeper in that area. So if you'd like to be a part of that wonderful and powerful morning and share just a part of your story uh, or something that God has done in your life recently, uh, some example of how he's helped you to overcome or gain victory in an area, uh, please reach out to me or to Pastor Danny Hunt or anyone on church staff. We'd love to get you involved in sharing on August 21st for our Testimony Sunday. And then the last thing before we get to the message today, uh, I'm super excited to be welcoming Francine to be giving a special announcement. Uh, A few months back, she approached me uh, about starting and launching a brand new ministry uh, as part of our church this fall, Uh, something that she's really passionate about, something that reflects uh, the journey that she has gone on personally, that God has walked beside her in. And really done some deep work in her life uh, around. So she's going to be joining us in a moment to just really unveil her heart and her passion for this ministry. Uh, so please join with me in welcoming Francine as she lets us know about this new program called Grief Share. Hi, this new program is one that's very near and dear to my heart. It's called Grief Share. It's a Christ-centered support group for those that are struggling with their grief. Maybe you yourself are in the middle of your your grief journey, and you're just struggling. Maybe you're stuck there. Maybe your hope and your joy just haven't returned back to your life yet. Or maybe you know someone in your life that could benefit from a program like this. Maybe this grief grief is a more recent grief or grief that goes back some years and you just haven't returned back to your normal self. Well, I know the program from experience is an excellent program. I have lost a couple of immediate family members and in the middle of the program, I found... Um, my, myself being normalized, my grief being normalized with the people around me and the stories they were sharing as well. As well, with grief, it's a very lonely journey and it helps you just feel a lot less alone. Grief Share is a 13-week program that involves three components. A video portion at the beginning, which in- includes interviews with um, leading experts in the field, as well as personal stories. So you hear more of people's journeys through their griefs their grief journeys. Um, It also involves uh, discussion time for those that would like to participate and share, as well as a workbook for each participant. So stay tuned in the next couple of weeks, whether you would like to serve in some capacity with this program now or in the future, or you feel you could benefit from the program, or maybe you know someone in your life that could benefit from as well. In the meantime, if you have questions or just would like some more information, reach out to myself or Pastor Danny Jones. We'd love to chat with you. Um, Or visit the website, griefshared.org. Thank you. Well, hello, church, and thank you for joining me again as we continue our series, More Than Shallow. Now, I was a lifeguard for a number of years, as I mentioned last week, grew up with a backyard pool, and I taught swimming lessons. So the idea of moving from a shallow end to a deep end, very strong resonance with me. I have so many stories. As I was preparing this message and last week's message, I was like, I just have so many for this series. It's not every day that you get a preaching series. It's like right in the niche of where all your good stories are. But uh, one that really resonated with me for today is this idea of moving from deep to shallow and teaching kids to go from the shallow end to the deep end. Because when I taught swimming lessons, as you can imagine, we start in the shallow end. You want to start in water where the kids can touch the bottom. They feel safe. They feel secure. And that's where they really develop the skills that we will then take into the deep end. But something I noticed that was very interesting to me is I had a lot of kids who 
when we were in the shallow end, when we were in the water that was, say, maybe chest height for them, where they could touch, they were excellent swimmers. I could have them swim the whole length of the pool there and back 50 meters. They wouldn't need to touch the bottom at all, and they'd return back to me totally fine. But then those same kids I would take into the deep end where they couldn't touch, and all of a sudden they would start complaining, saying that they don't know how, that they're not able to do it, and the fear would really grip them, and all of a sudden all those skills that I had seen in the shallow end would just evaporate in the deep end. And I would try and convince them, talk them into it, you know, like, hey, you just swam 50 meters by yourself without touching the bottom in the shallow end. It, you don't need to touch the bottom here, but it was still quite difficult for them to come over that hurdle. And I also taught adult classes. The adults were a lot more difficult because not only does an adult have a lot more hang-ups that they've picked up throughout life than a kid, but, you know, you have to talk the adults into the deep end. Whereas the kids, if they were really being obstinate, I would just kind of grab them, throw them in the middle of the deep end, and let them have a real hands-on learning experience. Because I know that they can do it. They just need to know that they can do it. The thing is that when with water, with swimming, once you know how to swim, the depth doesn't matter anymore and you're able to go as deep as you want because you are safe and have learned how to navigate the deep end. So today we're going to be talking about going deeper in service, volunteerism, good works, good deeds, all of those things. And this is one of those areas, as with so many things of God, that really the deep end has no bottom. We can just keep pressing, keep growing, keep developing in this area and keep finding more things that Jesus wants to reveal to us, more things that he has planned for us to do to partner with him in good works in our lives. But with service specifically, there is a level of danger if we don't know how to navigate, if we don't know how to swim in the deep end safely. We've all heard stories, maybe you've experienced it yourself, where serving in an unhealthy way can lead very quickly to burnout, exhaustion, fatigue. Serving more and more very quickly causes people to become disillusioned with the church experience or with their job or with anything in life. So it's important that as we go deeper in service, we learn to do that in a way that is healthy and is safe. Now, Unfortunately, when it comes to talking about going deeper in service, too often it's a one-dimensional conversation. You've probably heard messages before about what it means to go deeper in service, and really the only thing that's explored is time. Serve more, serve more frequently, serve longer, give more of yourself every Sunday, Wednesday nights, Friday nights. It fills up your calendar, and it leads to burnout. We're not talking about that today as we talk about going deeper in service. Time is definitely a component, but I would argue that the amount of time that we give to service will flow out of our maturity in this area, not the other way around. We do not become more mature in our understanding of service that we're doing to, for the Lord by just increasing the amount of time that we're serving until it breaks us. What we're going to be talking about today is attitude. It's our heart. It's our mind. It's what we believe about the service that we're bringing. It's what we, we know to be true about what it means to serve. Our attitude in this place, in, in the, the arena of service, is crucial to making sure that we're doing it at our best, that we're doing it in a way that's healthy and that's honoring to God. So let's talk today about attitude when it comes to service and learn how to go into the deep end together. But first, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we always thank you for the opportunity to be together, whether it's in person or online. Lord Jesus, you have given us an amazing church body to be a part of. We thank you for that. And we ask that you would illuminate your scriptures to us today, that we would learn something of you, of your heart, and of your plans for us. In your holy name, amen. So, to start, I wanted to talk about some bad attitudes, or at least some unhealthy attitudes towards serving. What does it look like to serve with the wrong heart? Well, the first one on the list for me, and, and one of the ones that I think is probably the most common, is serving from a place of obligation. 
feeling like you have to serve because that's what we do. Or, you know, mom dragged me to church and told me I have to volunteer, so that's what I do. And unfortunately, this is one of those areas that churches and organizations of many kinds, including our own families, can often prey on using guilt, using shame even, to get people to render service more than they normally would. Serving from a place of obligation is not what God wants for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 to 8 says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now, you might be thinking, isn't that verse about tithing or giving money? I'm pretty sure Pastor Danny Jones just read that to us like two weeks ago. And you're right, good remembering. We're going to find out, as I did when planning this message, that when we're talking about giving our time, there's a lot of parallels to giving our money. And in both cases, God is saying, hey, I don't want you to be giving out of obligation because you think you have to. God is asking us to bring our time, our labor, our energy to serving because we want to, because that's the desire of our heart is to serve and to to follow in his footsteps because Jesus ultimately was a servant. So we don't want to be giving out of a sense of obligation. But the next step up from that in another attitude that's still not hitting the mark would be giving out of a sense of transaction. Now, this to me represents like just the teeniest bit of maturity more than the obligation attitude, but there's still not a lot of health in this. What I mean by giving as a transaction uh, is that this is the kind of mentality of serving where it's like, well, I serve because I'm going to get something out of it. You know, I come to this church, I want my kids to be cared for in the nursery, so I should probably serve in the nursery once or twice. I want to have someone serve me coffee in the morning, so I should probably take a shift in the coffee shop eventually. And there is some level of understanding of the give and take of being in a faith community present here that is good because we're all in this together. You know, this church doesn't just run by robots. It's people that make all of this happen. It's you, it's me. And so we do, in a sense, give of our time and we receive from other people as they serve us. But when that is the heart behind our serving, we're removing a very core element and that is the love and the compassion And instead, we're turning something that was supposed to be a very kind act into just a cold calculus, tallying up whether it was worth it for us. The third bad attitude that I have identified when I was looking through this is one that is very common and unfortunately one that goes right down to some deep, dark roots in the church that I still don't think have been dealt with. And that would be serving out of a sense of fear. This is the works-based salvation. This is the thinking that if we don't do enough good, if we don't serve enough, that somehow we're going to not be saved, that we won't get into heaven, that we have to earn what Jesus did for us on the cross. And if you're wrestling with that, I need to be very clear. You are saved by grace alone through faith, the gift of Jesus Christ. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. He's not up there trying to count worked hours for who gets into heaven. Our giving of our time, our service should flow naturally from our salvation. It doesn't earn our salvation. But because we have been saved, we then respond with acts of good deeds in the name of Jesus. Now, the fourth kind of bad attitude would be serving out of a sense of personal glory or personal gain. Looking to puff ourselves up, looking to network, maybe rub elbows, choosing the most prestigious places to serve, trying to get our face, our name out there, when really the only name that we should be serving for is Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 is one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible, and it has this to say in verses 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. 
not looking to our own interests, but looking to the interests of each other. Now that we're starting to see the good heart of service, the healthy attitude of service, because all of these ones that I've mentioned, and there's far more, by the way, I've only picked four examples of some bad attitudes behind serving, but there's so many more. But the common thread through all of these is that the level of unhealth present when we're serving from a bad foundation, we are going to burn out. We are going to experience fatigue. And service, something that was intended by God to bring us life and joy and bring us closer to him, will actually become an unbearable weight. And it doesn't have to do with how much time we're serving. It doesn't have to do with where we're serving. It simply has to do with our own heart behind the service that we bring. Now, I want to recognize that there's a balance here. Service is one of those areas where we are balancing this desire to bring our time and our labor and our effort to God as an offering, as a sacrifice. But also, we need to make sure that we're not sacrificing our mental health, that we're setting healthy boundaries and protecting ourselves from being overworked, overburdened. This is something that is in God's heart. I mean, one of the very first stories in Genesis is about God making sure to institute rest. He cares about our health and making sure that we're not just burning the candle at both ends. This balance, I am always worried about, but at the same time, I don't worry because I know that God has a perfect plan. Sometimes it may seem difficult to find the path between serving and self-care but I promise you that God will never ask you to sacrifice your mental health for your spiritual health. God has a plan for you and for me that involves all of us living healthy, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, physically. He's not going to ask us to burn ourselves out on the altar of serving. And this really is sort of the crux of this maturity piece, this going deeper, is learning to navigate these waters, learning to navigate what it means to set healthy boundaries. Because the shallow and immature version of interacting with service too often either sets no boundaries <laughs> and burns out very quickly, or, and I would argue that this is even more common in our current society, sets too many boundaries or just abandons serving altogether. When the going gets tough, the shallow end is quick to retreat and to give up on serving and good deeds, all in the name of self-care or in setting boundaries. And I want us to learn today that there is a healthy middle where we know how to, in all seasons, bring God our best, bring him our service as an act of worship, while also making sure that we're living a healthy spiritual and emotional life. If a fellow Christian came up to you, brother and sister in Christ said to you, oh yeah, I'm going to give up on prayer for a while just to focus on me. Or if they said, oh, I'm, I'm taking a break from reading my Bible this year because it's going to be a really busy season. That would be a huge red flag for their spiritual health. Yet we so often let those statements go unchallenged when they're about service. I've heard it myself countless times, people saying, oh, you know, I, I'm just not going to serve at all for the next couple months because I'm going into a very busy season. Oh, I, I, I'm just not able to serve right now. I just, I really need to focus on me and do some, do some self-care in this time. And from a worldly perspective, it sounds like wisdom, but we know from a biblical standpoint that it isn't. Healthy service done as an act of worship to God is life-giving. And if we expect to return to a state of health, we have to make sure that doing good and serving the Lord is part of that journey back to health. Ignoring service altogether will actually be more detrimental to our spiritual well-being than we'd know. Now, the other thing I've heard is people talking about the gift of service. Uh, Erica Jones did a, a message back in May where she talked about the gifts of the Spirit. It's really good. It's on our YouTube channel, and you should check it out if you haven't heard it. One of those spiritual gifts is the gift of service. It's God giving a supernatural enabling to specific members of the church to be able to serve beyond their human limitations, to bring more than we could normally bring in our own strength. And this gift is real, and it does exist, but I've heard people use it as an excuse to not serve. 
They'll take a spiritual gift test, score low in service, or just think that they're not a server and use that as an excuse to do nothing. Well, I mean, for goodness sake, if you score low in the gift of mercy on a spiritual gift test, that doesn't mean you're allowed to be cruel. (laughs) We are all called to serve. And yes, some people have the gift of service where they will be able to just transcend human limitations and enter into a spiritual, supernatural level of that. But that doesn't let the rest of us off the hook. I think of our own volunteer team, and I just want to take a moment to thank our volunteers and to just really encourage them. We have an amazing team of volunteers right now, and and I've never been more proud to work with a group of people than I am of this team of volunteers right now. But on this team, we have a wide variety of gifts. And when it comes to the gift of service in particular, not everybody has that gift that's on the volunteer team. Some people, instead, they have a really strong gift of hospitality, and so you'll find them maybe hosting and welcoming you when you come into the building on a Sunday morning. Or maybe they have a really strong gift of teaching, and so they're down with our kids, like, reading curriculum and opening the Bible in a way that's going to change those lives forever. You don't need the gift of service to serve. We have other people on our team who do have the gift of service. I know of one person in particular who I will not name because I don't want to embarrass them. But they just have the gift of service in spades to the point where they literally are on my volunteer team every single Sunday. Because for them, service is how they worship the Lord. They've just really fallen into that mindset and that attitude properly. And so they're showing up with an amazing attitude, serving every week. And guess what? They don't get any credit. Most people in our church probably don't even know that this person serves every single Sunday, making sure that the service happens. And yet they don't care because they're bringing their service not to mankind, not because it's an obligation, but to the Lord as an act of worship. So how do we balance the equation of making sure that we're healthy and well-rested, but also making sure that we're serving. The Bible has the answer. Surprise, surprise. Let's jump first to Proverbs 11, 24 to 25. I love this verse. Proverbs 11, verses 24 and 25 says, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give, and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, And one who waters will themselves be watered. One who waters will be watered. There's a promise here that if we are pouring ourselves out in service as an act of worship, remember from that healthy heart, God will be refreshing us. When we're bringing our service, our well won't run dry. We won't run out. The idea is picked up further in Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. It's a very well-worn passage. Paul writes, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Do not grow weary in doing good. God will refresh us. That's the promise. When we try to take our own self-care in our hands and we ignore this pattern that God has set up where he wants us to be engaging with him and in response he's filling us and renewing us, but instead we try to pull ourselves out of that and try to just do it ourselves, we're not going to succeed and we're going to end up less healthy than when we started. We've got to trust in God. We have to have a correct attitude because when we have the correct attitude for our service, it brings life. So what is that correct attitude? I've mentioned it a little bit, but let's go into it. The correct attitude when it comes to service is to recognize that it is an act of worship. It is an act of worship. It is a sacrifice that we are presenting to God. This is summed up for me in Colossians 3, verse 17. I love this verse. It says, Whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Service is an act of worship as real and as important as our praise, our prayer, our preaching. 
service is a core element of what God wants us to be doing. Doing good to other people, serving others, washing each other's feet. Jesus gave us this example time and time again in the Gospels. We've all heard it said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Jesus wasn't just giving that lip service. He demonstrated his service, ultimately serving us by dying on the cross. And he has asked us, he has commanded us to do the same for those around us. We need to cultivate in our lives a well-balanced worship diet, and service is a core component of that. If I were to come to you and say, yeah, right now I'm on a diet, I literally only eat cheese, you would have some very real concerns for my health and probably also for the state of my bathroom because we can recognize that when we're not getting the whole meal, When we're missing out on something, it's not healthy. And service is a core element of a healthy worship diet. When we neglect serving, it's like we're completely ignoring and missing out on an entire facet of our relationship with God. He has something for us, something amazing and important in that realm. But we need to push in and we need to learn how to navigate it in a way that's healthy. That verse in Galatians that we read ends with the phrase to do good especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Now, of course, when it comes to serving, we do serve outside of these four walls, outside of the church, and we should do that. But let's not neglect serving here. The church is our training ground. It's our home. It's our family. This is where we learn. This is where we are equipped. This is where we hone our skills. Do not neglect serving in the church, whether it's as part of a Sunday morning service or with our students or with our kids or in the nursery, because when we're serving arm in arm and shoulder to shoulder with brothers and sisters in Christ, we are sharpening each other. We are learning from one another. And the lessons that we learn here, the training that we receive by serving here, will then empower our service outside. We are called not to neglect serving the family of believers, so make sure that that's on our list of things to look at. Now, I mentioned off the top that a a message on service will have a lot of parallels to a message on tithing and giving, and one of those parallels that's oh so important to me and something that I've seen myself and, and can testify to in my own life is God's power to multiply whatever we place in his hand. I've seen this with finances. We talk a lot about how when we tithe the 10%, the 90% that we hold back goes further than if we tried to keep the full 100. And the same is true of our time and our energy and our labor. When we give our service to God, he is faithful to multiply that service. And in more ways than one, on the one hand, he multiplies the service that I bring to him, making it go further. He amplifies that which I bring beyond my human ability so that the little service that I render can be made through his power to change lives. But additionally, he multiplies the time that I keep back, the time that is still mine, the the 90%, so to speak, so that when I'm giving, I find that in those seasons, when I'm really serving the Lord, it's not that I'm suddenly more busy. It actually feels like I'm accomplishing more. My time is suddenly more um, useful, more efficient. And that is part of God's promise to us, that God will come alongside. When we're doing the things he wants us to do, he's going to supply us with strength, with time, with the resources we need to do what he wants us to do. So let's talk about application to get into serving. Now, this is a journey from shallow into deep end. Not all of us are in the same place. Maybe you're watching this and you're doing great. You're swimming out into the deep end. Maybe you're watching this and you're like, I don't serve at all and I don't even know how to start. Don't worry. We're going to talk about it because this is something that it's a step by step. I'm not going to grab you like the kids that I throw in the deep end, I promise. This is something that we have to learn to navigate in a way that's healthy so that we can walk forward in this together. So I have four suggestions for us to learn this better. First is this. Speak to a friend or a mentor, someone who you trust and who knows you well, and have them identify for you 
your gifts, your passions. Maybe this is a time to do a spiritual gift test if that's something that you're familiar with. But in general, just asking someone who knows you really well, hey, what do you think are my skills? Where would you see me fitting in in the church volunteer world? This is a great way to get sort of that outside of you to start to learn, okay, this is, this is what other people are often receiving from me. Maybe there's a way that I can be plugged in to do that for more people or a way that I can really hone that skill or train that up. So ask the, someone you trust about your skills. Second, uh, start volunteering. <laughs> you can talk to me about that. I am currently coordinating our volunteers here at Sunshine Hills Church. You can send me a message. Uh, as of today, the volunteer availability for September and October uh, has been opened up. So that's a great way to just get in. Maybe it's even going to be just once a month, once every two months, just as a starting place. It doesn't matter where you are. You can always take another step forward. But don't hesitate. Jump in and, and just start somewhere. And maybe you'll learn that it was the wrong place. That's okay. It means you can just move on to another place next time, but it's a learning experience, and you only learn if you take chances. Third is to start small and grow big. Like I said, there's no nothing to be gained from burning yourself out all in a week because you decided to just go and serve and serve and serve without any sort of direction or purpose. Start at a place that's manageable and start growing from there. We have lots of people on our current volunteer team, and they volunteer just once a month, maybe once every two months when they can, and that's great. That still is worship, and I would encourage you, if you're one of the people that's volunteering once a month, maybe try two times a month. Growing step by step is how we do this in a way that's healthy. And fourth, look for opportunities to stretch your service whether that's opportunities to stretch it in the amount or the frequency, looking for new ways to maybe say, oh, you know, I, I am going to serve a little bit extra, or I'm going to stay late and help clean up on this, or I'm going to do good for the, the person in our church that, you know, is in the hospital or just had a new baby. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go make them a meal or buy them dinner or something. But look for opportunities to stretch, and look for opportunities to stretch that you may have normally glossed over. As we start to grow in this, God will provide open doors for us to step through. So next time you hear someone call for a volunteer for something, if your first reaction is like, oh, no, 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 that's, that's not me. I don't, I don't do that. I don't serve with kids. Oh, I, no, I don't, I don't actually know how to, you know, work a soundboard. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't really feel like talking to people like that. That's not my gifting. I want to challenge you to just give it a try. Stretch some of those serving muscles, and maybe you'll learn about a new passion that you never knew you had. Above all, though, whether we're serving a little, whether we're serving a lot, whether we're serving on Sundays or any other day of the week, whether we're serving inside the church or outside the church, let's do it all in the name of Jesus, recognizing that when we bring our service, it is an act of worship and praise to our amazing creator and savior. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this time, and thank you that we can worship you in this way, that you're a God who cares about us, body, soul, and spirit, that you want us to be worshiping you in all aspects of our life because it will bring us life in return. Lord, for those who have been hurt, who have been abused in this area, who have been obligated or guilted or shamed into service in the past, I pray for your healing touch. Lord Jesus, that should never have happened. And it, it breaks my heart to hear of stories where people have had something that was supposed to be so pure and worshipful turned into a duty or an obligation. So Lord, would you bring healing and restoration so that we can all bring our service to you with just clean hands, pure hearts, renewed minds. Thank you, Lord. And Jesus, for those who are struggling with where they fit or who are wrestling with negative uh, worldly wisdom regarding service, would you just clear out all the junk and help us to learn who you are and how you want us to serve, how you want us to bring our time and our effort to you. Lord Jesus, ultimately, you tell us how to worship you. So we pray that your Holy Spirit would communicate that to all of us in this season. 
Now, if you're watching this and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, just by praying along with me now, you can welcome him into your life. And I know I've talked a lot about service, but ultimately what I'd love for you to hear is that when we align ourselves with God, when we have a relationship with Jesus, even our service brings us life and joy and peace. That has been my experience, and I can promise you that that's what's awaiting you if you pray this prayer along with me. Jesus, I give you my life. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, cleanse me of unrighteousness, and welcome me into your family. I declare that you are the Lord and Savior of my life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I'd love a chance to hear about it. You can send me a message. You can call the church office. But we just want to celebrate with you if you made that decision. Now, as I mentioned uh, during the message, we are opening volunteer uh, availability for September, October. For those who may not know, we've moved to a new system for our volunteers right now. So uh, there is a Google form. It will be available on our Facebook page. It'll also be available um, to our current volunteers. So if you are on the volunteer list, you'll be getting that today. And uh, you can just fill out the form for the two-month chunk, September, October, and just tick off any Sunday that you're available uh, and any area on those Sundays that you'd like to volunteer, and then I make the schedule. My guarantee to you is that I will do my best to never schedule you more than you request and to never schedule you back-to-back -to, -back to make sure that you are still able to get into services, still able to uh, have that balance. So that's what I've been working really, really hard to, to do because I want to honor when you bring your service to the Lord and, and submit that availability. I want to really honor that. So I encourage you, get involved, get plugged in, get serving. Let's do it together. Have a great rest of your week.